you know, you're talking about an unknown unknown, right? So they, they don't even have a framework for how to think about this stuff most of the time. And so here you are coming and saying, let's talk about this. And, and, and that can be very off-putting and very, make someone very defensive naturally, right? Um, the other piece of it is you're really having people confront their mortality. And that's equally, if not more, uh, disturbing to somebody who's not prepared for it. Hey, y'all, it's Costa. Today, I'm here with my guest, Maxwell Schmidt. Certified long-term care specialist, senior advisor, CEO of YetWorth, and author of Planting the Seed, 20 Ways to Preserve Your Yet Worth. Today, we're talking about who actually needs long-term care insurance. Max, it's an honor to have you on the show with us. Let's start with the basics. What is long-term care insurance, and how is it most commonly used? I mean, simple question, but also kind of what a loaded question, right? I mean, long-term care insurance, that's like six syllables with some pretty charged up words, right? Um, yeah, people really get stuck on it just based on their preconceived notions, whether it's true or invented. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But out of those six syllables, there's really one that sticks out the most to me, and that's the word care. These are ultimately benefits that pay for care, more accurately care expenses, but Start by zooming out, right? It, it's for that care. And yes, of course, there's you know important policy language and benefit structures and eligibility triggers and all that good stuff. But you got the thirty thousand foot view here, being that care aspect. So let's define that a little bit more. It, care is not companionship, and that's what a lot of people end up believing. Unfortunately, we think of all the cuddly stuff, like oh, I've got to be there to support my spouse or what have you, and and support is obviously absolutely important in these conditions. But, you know, I'm just thinking about the actual nitty gritty stuff. You know, I've got three kids, six, four, and two. And and yes, while companionship and cuddles are all part of that equation, I think it helps thinking about that stuff because it gets really dirty. You have to imagine all the stuff that you got to deal with with as we get older, right? So, because we tend to revert. So it's it's a big cycle. If you picture like a circle and you start at the bottom at six o'clock and you go up to, to noon, the top of the circle, which is like the time in which you're most healthy, most independent, most capable, um, everybody comes back down. That's just the natural life cycle. Um, but you can think of it more of like a, a health cycle. So in, in fact, I, just before COVID, I took a tour of this place called the Buck Institute for Research and Aging. And they explained the difference, uh, like a lifespan and a health span. And so the average lifespan at the time was about 82. The average health span was 69. So that's a 13 year delta. And their mission is to close that gap by increasing health spans, not reducing lifespan. Uh, and they probably don't want me to say this, but they're still a long way off. So that means we've, we've got some work to do, right? Because historically, this is the space where long term care comes in to help people with their ADLs, uh, like we were managing for children the bathing, the dressing, the continence, the toileting. Um, transferring all that and, and all the instrumental activities that come with that too, right? So it's, you know, the laundry, the preparing the meals, et cetera. So I think it's important to also point out that there are some disabilities like Alzheimer's that have, you know, symptoms such as dementia, where you are maybe physically there, but you can't, you know, you, you, you know, you, you might lose, you, you may, you may forget where, you know, where you are and have to find your way back home. Um, you have like forgetfulness. Um, I mean, just the fact that you may not be able to, to stay at home by yourself, you know, is a, is a huge, uh, barrier for a lot of people to be able to have some freedom and stability as a caregiver in their lives. And, even though I know in the form of companionship, it may not be exactly what we're talking about, but having somebody that's skilled and specialized to be able to provide those wraparound supports, I think is a really important component to bring to the table um, so that those types of bad things, uh, those um, life-threatening things don't happen. So that's an expensive proposition too. Exactly. Oh my gosh. And I mean, to your point though, jumping back to the supervision required during a care cognitive disability scenario, um, you know, I was just talking to an advisor who was asking if it's maybe time to open up a claim for his client because Mm -hmm. what was going on is, you know, he was, the, the client was an electrician for 40 years 
Um, and so he was having some, some issues um, back at home. His wife called him, called the advisor saying, hey, you know, he's, he started a couple fires playing around with the electrical box. Do you think it's time that we can start using this long-term care policy? He can still do mm-hmm. everything else. It's like, you should have called yesterday. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a problem for everybody's right. safety. And, you know, we need to make sure that he's supervised yeah. so that everybody can continue to live as much of a normal life as possible. Right. We know that about 70% of people will need long-term care sometime in their life. So why don't 70% of people have long-term care insurance? Oh, man. Another loaded question, right? I mean, it's hard to answer that without really pointing fingers, it feels like, in some way. That's okay. Uh, But, uh, you know, someone or some part of society is like, probably at fault, right? So I'll just do this and point the finger right back at myself. I mean, I'll sure. I'll take the fall for this one collectively, okay. um, just on behalf of insurance brokers and financial advisors, pretty much. That's that's what it comes down to. And it, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of been a contentious fight between those two facets of the industry, those two pockets, in insurance brokers and financial advisors. There's kind of a, a silent or maybe not so silent, um, you know, I won't call it a war necessarily, but there's strong opinions on either side about the best way to deliver certain pieces of advice, which model is better for people, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately, through all that noise, our clients are the ones who are getting completely overlooked. So, mm-hmm. I mean, listen, I, I just saw a study conducted by a carrier that indicated 45% of financial advisors don't even consider long-term care insurance in their planning. And before insurance planners start salivating on that number, I bet it's even less among insurance brokers. So, um, you know, and many have told me as much too, right? The, I'll never forget early in my career, I called on this big time advisor. I knew very well through my local NAPA chapter. He told me point blank, if I do my job, then my clients never need long-term care insurance. And, and you know what? I actually believed him for a long time, a long time, an embarrassingly long time. It was about, I would say maybe six, seven years ago when I decided to actually crunch the numbers uh, against this, you know, self-fund versus insured debate. And realized that the, the premium people were paying on the back end far exceeded the premium on the front. So simply put, right. if you tally the average cost of care today, and for a high net worth client that we're, this guy's talking about, we're talking ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month, home care or residential, it doesn't matter. Right. It's ten to fifteen thousand for high level of service, which is what these clients come to expect. And so quality outcomes, quality of care, exactly. all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So if you're going to eat through one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year minimum, um, if you have that average claim scenario of three to four years, you're looking at somewhere between 360000 to 720000 and that's after tax. So call it half a million to a million from a taxable account, and that's not even the worst case scenario by far, as we know. So, well, yeah. I mean, you put pen to paper, and it makes sense for you, and you're right. in the industry. Why don't more people just put pen to paper and figure it out? I think, yeah, I think it comes down to a few things, right? You've got, you know, you've got some obstacles in the way. And I think this is, it's really more emotional than anything else. If, I see it mm-hmm. as two, two core issues that you're going to see some, um, some defensiveness in the client. A is the fact that, you know, you're talking about an unknown unknown, right? So they, they don't even have a framework for how to think about this stuff most of the time. And so here you are coming in saying, let's talk about this. And, and, and that can be very off-putting and very sure. take someone very defensive naturally, right? Um, the other piece of it is you're really having people confront their mortality. And that's mm-hmm. equally, if not more uh, disturbing to somebody who's not prepared for it. So there's, there's methods and ways in which you can gently approach this stuff. You know, if you're bringing an illustration to that first meeting, you're going to you're going to lose a client probably and that's i think that's where a lot of people are coming from or they think that this is going to happen to them as an advisor if you're sitting in this position i'm not going to talk about long term care they don't want to talk about it i don't want to talk about it nobody wants to talk about it cuz it's um, like a deal killer it's it's all it could be yeah if that's yeah. kind of their their mo i guess but sure. but it could be more i think the the ruder the more of a root issue here would be like a relationship killer you know we're, I see. we're very much in the relationship business if you bring in something off putting like that that's not the normal investment strategy we're talking about in our quarterly meetings or what have you. So this is just kind of feels like it's out of left field because you never laid the groundwork for this discussion. And I think that's really what we're missing here is people, uh, advisors, insurance brokers are not laying the adequate groundwork to, to really have a more informed discussion about it. So I'm all about just planting the seeds early, 
saying, you know, something on the roadmap that we need to talk about at some point down the road is, you know, the, the care experience. And we have a really good method and process for the, coming up with a needs analysis for you and, and identifying what your options are, um, whether it's through another specialist or, or whatever it may be, and just identifying that as part of the normal process uh, without jumping straight into it, you know, right. cold like that. So that, that let's talk about step. let's talk about premium. Sure. So on average, how much is a monthly or an annual premium for a long-term care policy? And how does the price of long-term care insurance change with age? And typically, what impacts it the most? Yeah, so it, it varies so much. Um, and I know that's a cop-out, but it is that's the okay. truth. I mean, <laughs> it, it really depends. So, You're going to have to give us a range at some I'll point. Get, I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> how about right now? So okay. the, I always like to show... A two hundred dollar option, no matter what, you know, and no matter how small it is, you know, showing that sure. two hundred dollar a month option per individual is is usually going to at least be, uh, if it's not a plan design that people go for, it'll be a great starting point for the conversation. I think two hundred that that just seems to be the data indicates that's been about the average premium for mm -hmm. a long, long, long time. I think it's crept up a little bit more in recent years, but even to within five years ago, I want to say the running average for the last 15 years before that was about $200 a month. So mm -hmm. I just have that in the back of my mind as kind of an anchor point for the discussion. And then we'll talk about what the actual needs are as well, because you know I alluded to something that was kind of a, a loaded term as well, which was the, um, the premium on the back end. So if you're really running the numbers and you're putting pen to paper, um, you're talking about, you know, a, a scenario where you could lose about a million dollars, um, which would result if you're using the 4% rule, that would be about $40,000 of income lost from the income asset that that million dollars would produce every year thereafter. And while that doesn't sound like a big deal to the person undergoing the care scenario, you know, what you're, what you're doing is you're setting up a surviving spouse for a really um, tough situation financially. And so, you know, if it's somebody who has $10 million and they're missing, you know, and they're making that 400,000 or whatever using the 4% rule, that is less of a chunk, but it still could be the difference between, you know, that second home or whatever the situation may be at that point. So just take yeah. into account that all those assets are already allocated. Okay, so I, I was talking to somebody with 15 million net worth, a client who applied and, and was approved recently. Um, and he was, you know, you know, I asked him about the self-insurance concept and he straight up said, point blank, he's like, that means we would have to liquidate something. And that is not something I'm prepared to do with my family right. and our goals. We love the lifestyle we live now. And I don't want to take any of that apart to pay for a long-term care scenario. And this is somebody with 15 million. So your client with 5 million probably could operate off of the same um, the same program there. So there's something more to think about on the back end premium. On average though, I mean people save roughly about three hundred thousand dollars to for retirement. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't save right. a million to five to right. ten to fifteen. That is, there are people that do that, obviously as you know. Yeah. But that's a very small percentage. Call so it true. maybe 10% of the U.S. population. And I know I'm being gracious there. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, I but, think you are. But, but yeah, like I, if somebody, if somebody's only saving $300,000 for retirement and they want to preserve at least something in terms of generational wealth to pass on to their families, mm -hmm. why would they not buy long-term care insurance right? and right. spend $200 a month? Like, is the is the cost of the premium can it be just ridiculously unaffordable and if that is the case what type of health outcomes contribute to that unaffordability yeah you can you can definitely see it tick up from a, the premium from a uh, health perspective um, okay you know it, it's it's one of those things though that i think more often you'd see a decline um, from the carriers these days and and that's where you know we okay. haven't even dived into this yet but you know, you're probably looking at based on financial or health outcomes, only half of people really being even eligible for long term care insurance. I, see. I think more of that half need to be aware that this is an opportunity and not some sort of cost that they're going to have to negotiate at some point. Like you are one of the lucky ones if you are financially or health savvy enough to to yeah. or you know well enough to be able to qualify for these policies. So. 
Um, you know, we kind of look at it as this, as this gray cloud of insurance planning that, you know, you want to, you don't want to have to deal with, maybe you just want to get it over with, but, um, but it's really a, a cool opportunity for people to throw their chips in and say, you know what, I'm going to spread this risk out with, you know, uh, maybe 12 to, uh, to a hundred million of my best friends, um, to sure. shoulder the burden together. There you go. Do you think that long-term care insurance should be required in the United States? Uh, <laughs> like car insurance, kind of. I see what you're saying. Um, I, I'm I'm a big free market guy, so I'm going to sure. go ahead and say no based on that philosophy. However, it already is required, and if you look at it from a slightly different perspective, and that's you know looking at it through the Medicaid lens, right? Right. Everybody has access to insurance. We're all paying into a system that ultimately pays a benefit or funds a system that you can access if you um, if you qualify for Medicaid. And uh, granted, that's not something a lot of people are out there striving to do because if you're familiar with Medicaid and, and California, Medi-Cal, um, you, know, you, you have to pass an asset test, at least in 49 right. states, um, which we'll, I think we'll jump into in a second on that 50th state. But Based on those 49, you got to spend down all of your assets to about $3,000, give or take. And um, that that doesn't include the home or your car or a little weekly allowance. But uh, generally, you know, you're impoverished if you qualify for Medicaid. And so that's something that, you know, I think a lot of people find is, is, is a good fallback. But I think it's worth mentioning here that it is a safety net. It was always intended to be a safety net for people who didn't have the means to take care of themselves in older age. And so that is really, I think, the outlook that I would share with people and, and give an example from my own personal history, too. So my, my grandmother had Parkinson's for about seven years when I was a kid. And, and this was something that, you know, we were not prepared for as a family. We had a disability insurance agency. My parents ran um, and actually my grandmother's husband had died earlier on, but um, he started the business. He started that disability insurance agency bef before long-term care was even you know, a, a, a real consideration for the public. Mm -hmm. um, and so when she needed the care in the 90s, she spent down everything. She sold her house, um, you know, spent down literally to the last few thousand dollars, um, and the writing was on the wall. She was gonna run out of money and was gonna need to move into a Medi-Cal facility in my native California. And when, that happened she, as soon as she made the move it was clearly a drop in care at the time you know i not not trying to cast a general um you know feeling over how the medical system works or the medicaid system but at the You're time absolutely it was right. a clear drop in standard mm -hmm. of care and as a child um going in there to visit grandma when she's quite literally on her deathbed and just having that smell i'll never forget the smell i'll never get that in my out of my head um, of walking into that facility and just being like, this place is disgusting and, and I need, I'm never coming back basically right. is what my sister and I said to each other. Um, and, and she, she died there within a couple of months because there was just something changed, right? I'm not going to yeah. call it a will to live or anything like that, but it, it was just clear that this was, this was the end for her mm. as soon as she made that change. My grandfather had the exact same experience. And he also divested in Georgia, um, was eligible and qualified for Medicaid in Georgia. I visited him two times in the facility. He was in two separate facilities and he just, yeah, he, he was the most vibrant, full of life person. Mm -hmm. And when he went into the nursing facility, you could just tell that life just got sucked out of him and he didn't want to be there. And he realized that there was no way that in that environment he could have gotten better. Right. But he just wished, I think the, you know, towards the end, I remember some conversations that I had with him on the phone and I just, I knew that what he really wanted was just the chance to spend time with us to be able to improve his quality of life because these facilities that are funded by Medicaid and I'm very familiar with Medicaid. We work with Medicaid in Tennessee all the time. So we know the struggles okay. and challenges that they have. Um, and we always, always, always push conversations towards long-term care insurance as much as we can. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, their, their resources are stretched very thin and, yes. and the individuals that are working there are usually underpaid and facilities are understaffed and it's just difficult to, to manage that, that long-term care. I, I do want to talk more about Medicaid, but before we do, I just want to interject on something that I think would be very helpful for, for people that are listening and watching. In your opinion, how can we start having these conversations about you know, getting long-term care insurance and even considering a care plan conversation? How can we start having those conversations a little bit earlier? I think... In my opinion, it all stems from the understanding of retirement income. And I think that's a little bit of a different flavor than a lot of insurance planners take on this. Mm -hmm. But I think once you understand what your nest egg looks like and everything that you're working towards in your career to develop this nest egg so that you can finally take a break from working. Right. Um, and, and have some passive income and just enjoy life as a retiree, if that's still the goal for you, then understanding and identifying that number and what that income support looks like from that number is really fundamental to determining how much long-term care insurance you're going to need. Because if you're trying to save, you know, and I like to just use the 4% rule as, as sort of a, a quick and easy math withdrawal rate um, mm -hmm. from your nest egg. So again, it, you know, using that, that $10 million example, that would be a nice one, right? Um, you've got $400,000, which is 4% of 10 million that you can take out um, per year. So that's, that's really the goal, right? And then if it's, you know, if it's 5 million, put, cut that in half. So you're looking at 200,000. If it's two and a half million, you're looking at a uh, hundred thousand dollars of, of income. Mm -hmm. So that's really, I think people need to have a better understanding of that. And then once they determine that, okay, that hundred thousand dollars a year is really what I need to survive. Um, okay. Well, what does that look like monthly? That's 8,300 a month taxable. In many cases, a large part of that asset is going to be taxable. I think for most people, unless mm -hmm. it's all in a Roth or cash value or something like that. But generally speaking, it's going to, a significant portion of that's going to be taxable. And then, and then from there, how much of that and Social Security, another key factor to understand in this equation, at pension too, if that's part of you know, government, um, right. usually government, hard to find in the private sector these days. Um, but you know, calculate the Social Security, calculate the pension, calculate that retirement income from the expected or projected nest egg, and then determine what the cost of care is going to be. So these are the steps that I like to take because, you know, we talk a lot about the question of self-insurance, which um, is a misnomer. And I'll credit the great Bill Comfort on that on that line because he, he loves he loves to, to really underscore that because insurance is a spread of risk among right. other people. You're not self-insuring anything because what you're really doing is self-funding um, anyway. A little aside for, for Bill. Um, and then we uh, love Bill. But, <laughs> He's great. So the the but if you're going to be self funding, you know you you don't necessarily need to self fund the full amount, and and conversely, you don't need to fully insure the entire care experience. You know, there's a lot of gray area. There's this. It's not option one or option two. There's a huge 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and so on um, that's in between. And we just need to determine how much of that can we self fund. How much of a gap are we looking at? And how much would we like to have that will help us not have to worry about that gap? <laughs> because that's another right. consideration that a lot, a lot of risk averse people are going to want to take. And especially so. if you're an individual who's going to retire with, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five million dollars, ten million dollars. So just to put into perspective, just some quick math, you know, you do on the back of a napkin. You know, if you consider home care, depending on what type of health outcomes what type of health conditions and, or diagnoses that you might have very easily would you could it be possible for you to require 8 hours of care a day uh, you know and if you consider 8 hours of care a day in a major market like say for example Miami you're going to be paying an individual at least $25 an hour if you want oh, them yeah. to be dependable reliable um perform at a high level you know uh, somebody that's committed to further education you know, because obviously these types of disabilities are constantly evolving. And 
I mean, consider that $25 an hour for an eight hour day, that's 200 bucks a day. That's your entire mm -hmm. monthly premium in one day, you know, and that's, <laughs> and honestly, eight hours a day, five days a week is somebody that has a physical disability, somebody that may have just, you know, had a significant injury, like a fall that resulted in a surgery, like a hip replacement, which is very common or a knee mm -hmm. replacement, um, you know, if you've suffered from a stroke, which happens all the time, if you have any type of paralysis in any extremity of your body, like everybody thinks like, this is crazy. No, it happens every single day and it's so expensive. And you could have literally spent $200 a month before any type of significant severe medical event occurred to ensure yourself so that you had at least a $200 a day benefit that was paid out to you to cover the costs. So I think um, I love the quantifiable perspective that you take from the perspective of retirement. I take the same quantifiable aspect just from the, the cost of care uh, right. and, and humanize it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, man, I like right. this. This is going good. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, uh, that what you're bringing in is, is so important for people to understand because, you know, you see these expenses just sh shoot off the page yeah. in today's dollars. Yeah. And then you factor in, we're talking about an event that potentially could be 20, 30 years down the road. Um, and so how does inflation play into all that? Well, we know about healthcare inflation yep. and how it usually outpaces normal inflation and everyone's pulling their hair out about normal inflation right now. So um, just exponentiate that, I guess, is, yeah. is really, my, you know, without getting too into the dollars and cents of it, you know, you can, you can basically double it in 25 years, right? The, the cost, conservative. Reproduction. Absolutely. And at the cost of the cost of care in a small community in the middle of Tennessee has gone from about $15 an hour in 2012 to yes. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. That was that was the cost that for for me to pay somebody. Mm. It went to twenty five dollars an hour. If you extrapolate that into what a person ends up paying for it, they're paying anywhere around thirty two dollars an hour in a small town like Tennessee. If right. some of the major markets that I've looked into um, over the course of even the last four years are closer to the forty dollar range. If you look at like New oh, York, yeah. L.A., and so. These are this is it's really hard to self fund this like extremely hard and and when we talk about long term care insurance it's just something that I'm so passionate about because nobody wants to listen to me whenever I say it until it's too late and then it's like well did you get long term care insurance no I literally just had this conversation with my father in law who's seventy two whose brother is suffering from a cognitive disability and oh, no. it's just like. No one wants to talk about the fact that he's cognitively dis co he's having early onset, you know, m most likely early onset Alzheimer's. But at the same time, no one wants to address the fact that he has this disability. And also nobody wants to address the fact that they don't have long-term care insurance. But I told him, I said, at this point, he's probably not going to get approved for a long-term care insurance policy. And so as we're talking, and I just literally had this conversation a day ago, it's just, it's so... It's so relative to everything that we're discussing right now. And, it, and it's happening in our own families every single day. You know? True so. story. True story. All right. Moving on. Sorry, I had to get on that soapbox for, for a second no, there. That's great. How will yeah. changing enrollment qualifications for Medicaid programs like Medi-Cal impact the need for long-term care insurance? I think, yeah, you say impact. I think, uh, I, I don't know if it's, if it's, uh, one of those words that's a homophone. Does that mean, is that a double meaning? Mm -hmm. Um, but you talk about ho homonym? impact, homonym, that, homonym. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Homonym word guy doesn't know the word. <laughs> it's all good. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you're talking about impact, like in how it affects things and also impactedness, sure. I think, you know, we're, we're looking at both versions of that word here. Um, you know, Medi-Cal specifically. Um, so as a primer for our, our informed audience, um, Medicaid is known as Medicaid in 49 states. Mm -hmm. In California, it's known as Medi-Cal. So just remember that. 
through this discussion and, and also in 49 states, you are required to be impoverished. And I think I mentioned this earlier, yep. down to about $3,000 in assets to qualify for Medicaid. Right. But in my native California, they are expanding the eligibility requirements by completely eliminating the asset test next year. So January 1. Let me spell that out for that you. That is wild. I'm from Marin County. It's just across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth, truly, without mm -hmm. question. Um, do, do you happen to know the average home price in Marin County? Costa? Um, can I guess? Take a guess. Okay. A guess. Um, million bucks? Pretty close. 1.466 million. Wow. And that's down 6% this year. Okay. So Marin has had a high percentage of of you know of affluence, um, but also a super high percentage of older people compared to the rest of the state, and certainly compared to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, it's also got a high cost of living. So the one thing that I think a lot of people miss about California, which is you know it's got this reputation as being this high tax state, property taxes are actually locked in at the time of purchase. So if you bought a little bungalow in Tiburon. Uh, in 1976 for wow. $200,000, and now it's worth $2 million, and your property tax is pegged in, locked in at $2,000 a year, 1% of that, of that uh, original purchase price. Are you liquidating that asset and moving anytime soon? Absolutely no. not. Not into a townhome worth $1.1 million, and it's over $10,000 in taxes, right? Mm -hmm. People are, are super house rich and cash poor in Marin. Um, and so, and this is just kind of a representative place of, uh, of it, it's a little unique in, the, in certain facets, but it is pretty representative of Cal California in general, Fascinating. Pro property prices. Um, so even though they're sitting on these massive assets, they can now sell their assets, right? And, and keep them. So they can sell that $2 million house, put that 2 million in the bank and still go into a Medi-Cal facility. So these, these, those factors, they all result in probably a lot of people who are sitting on a huge asset and have access to this new system. And that would be great if Medi-Cal had the capacity. See, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against Medi-Cal in the big safety net. I think that's, that's great for people in need. We it's need not feasible though. Net. It's just a math problem. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, there's just, the math doesn't work I know. as far as I can see. And so, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Finish your thought, please. Oh, I was just going to I was just going to cap it off by reminding people, you know, our informed listeners here that there is this silver tsunami approaching too, right? So you've got the oldest baby boomers. How old are they? They're about to turn 80 in a couple of years. So what comes next is just going to distress the system. There's never been a more important time for owning private long-term care insurance in California, in my opinion. Absolutely. And here's the thing. Medi-Cal as we addressed earlier and Medicaid in general they don't reimburse providers for val from a value-based perspective. So they're not saying, give me the highest quality of service and I will reimburse you for that service that you're providing. No, they're saying like, hey, just like every other state, all 50 states, the largest budget line item in each, in each state budget is their Medicaid program. So they're like, already it's the most expensive part. We have to figure out a way to keep this cost effective so they keep prices down or cost down, reimbursement down, which means that usually the individuals in these facilities are um, underpaid. Uh, and it's difficult to take care of anybody else when you can't take care of yourself. You know, I say that on the show often. So while very well people are going to have access to long-term care because it's an inevitability, I think people have to remember that, and they're going to access this Medicaid marketplace, they're going to realize that the outcomes that they were looking for are not there health outcomes, quality of care outcomes, quality of service outcomes. So what ends up happening is the family has to then fill in all of the gaps. And so if you don't have long-term care insurance, what you're missing is control. Control of how you receive care, where you receive care, when you receive care, and by whom. Okay, so if you have the ability to buy a policy early in life and you need to access the long-term care marketplace. You can do it on your terms. Even though Medicaid is free, right? Relative. Mm -hmm. 
you don't have control of where you're going to go because the companies or the um, the providers that are going to cater to the non-Medicaid market are going to be even more expensive now because the demand is going to get even higher, right? So exactly. it's, these are all things to consider. I, I, I will say from a, from a, from a feasibility standpoint, and I know we're, I know we're getting a little technical here, maybe a little bit off topic, but I just, I have to say it since we're on the topic of it, it, it there is absolutely no way that Medicaid can absorb the amount of people in California that will need these services. When we're talking about 70% of people needing long-term care after the age of 75, first baby boomer just turned 75 in 2021, like we're on the roller coaster getting to the top, you know, <laughs> it's not slowing down. Right. Nope. And so nope. we are, I mean, the, the cost overruns are huge. There's a reason, folks, for anybody that's watching, there's a reason why Medicare does not want to pick up the long-term care bill. They don't want to create a public option for long-term care as you, would, as you see it whenever you turn 65 and you get Medicare. It's because they can't afford it. <laughs> so... And they quite seriously looked at it. They too. did. It was part yes. of the Affordable Care Act yes. in, in 2009, right? Yeah. So, you know, they, they did the feasibility study. They said adverse selection was a serious issue mm -hmm. in the way that the law was structured. And they pulled it off the shelf after it had been passed. So yeah. it's, it tells you a lot about the real need for this stuff and how we can fund it or, lack, or not fund it. Before we wrap up, though, I do want to ask you just one quick thing. Sure. Let's say nobody so let's say somebody watches this video and they're like these guys are crazy let's just you know like sometimes when you talk to your financial advisors and they're like you're crazy like i'm not going to talk to my clients about this they don't need it they're going to self-fund what does that actually look like and realistically what percentage what percentage of people can actually afford to self-insure oh boy yeah I, percentage of people I, I don't know. I'd be best guessing there. You know, I it'd probably be less than five percent of the U.S. Um, population. Of the U.S. population, yeah. less than five percent. It's accurate. Um, yeah, safely, right? Yeah. Safely, without with running the Monte Carlos, all the simulations, you know, and being able to absorb that. It's you know less than five percent. Maybe probably even less than that. Um, but you know, you've got a lot of people who are going to try to make it work, right? And so. Even understanding, you know, what that looks like, even for just the, the next 5%, you know, the highest 10% of savings, people who have the highest 10% of savings or income um, in retirement, you know, they're going to probably try to self-insure, right? I mean, most more than that are going to self-insure. We know that, right. you know, just by looking at the, the whole distribution of this marketplace, I think we're still stuck at that 10% penetration number or less. Seven, um, yeah. Seven. Oh my God, it's dropped. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in trouble. So it just comes down to, you know, it, you know, you're looking at 93% of people either self insuring or using some sort of government assistance. And right. um, those, you know, maybe you say the bottom, let's just call it the bottom 50% are mm -hmm. going to use some sort of government assistance. Yep. Well, you still got, what is that, 40, uh, 43% that are going to be self insuring. That's that. Those are the folks we need to be striking these conversations well with. Be very self-aware. You know, I think you know, who was it who said, um, uh, you know, Americans are not socialists because they're all just embarrassed millionaires, temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Um, <laughs> that's. I think that was a Steinbeck. Quote okay, Steinbeck. I like it. And so, um, you know, have some self-awareness, yeah. right? Like, understand that, you know, you're not. You're not going to hit the lotto. Right. You're not going to, it's not going to happen quite the way that maybe you've been hoping for your entire 50 year career. If you've been working that long. It's, it's going to, it's going to be something that you need to plan for. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be full insurance. You know, you don't need to wholly 100% insure your long term care scenario, but understand what the math, what the math is behind it. Yeah. You know, deduct from the social security amount that you're expecting. First, figure that out, right? Secondly, figure out what your retirement income looks like and then do the math, do it, you know, do it smartly, work with somebody who can, who can help you intelligently and, and um, you know, financial advisor can do that, an insurance broker, 
uh, who specializes in long-term care could, could go along with yeah. that. Yeah, and that 43% of people that you're talking about, those are all middle-income Americans. I mean, not all, yeah. but the majority of them. I'd say probably 35% of the 43. And so, yeah. like, those are people who have worked their entire lives, have built a career, have raised, you know, raised a family or, or you know, essentially worked in a professional environment, um, maybe even had a small business, like that are going to retire in some capacity with that two to three hundred thousand dollar, maybe five hundred thousand, but under a million dollars. And those right. are the people that should be getting this insurance more than anybody else. You know, like like y'all, you're gonna have to divest all your resources, qualify for Medicaid, then get your long term care paid for, average stay in a facility, just average average um utilization of long-term care is 3.2 years. So if on average long-term care costs anywhere between 40 and 125,000, you're going to spend a lot of money on it and it may be all of your money. So just hedge, you know, just hedge by buying a policy. And it like, like you were saying, it doesn't have to be $200. It could be, you know, maybe 50 or a hundred dollars a month, Right. you know, something. Right. And, you know, obviously I think the elephant in the room is, uh, you've got to exercise and you've got to take care of your body and you've got to make sure that you're not one of, you know, the one and two that are, are considered overweight or morbidly obese. Cause that leads to adverse health outcomes. Like those are all things that you have to do to make sure that you, that you may never even have to use your policy, you know? Right. So we, exactly. we always, Stay strong. it's exactly. We always like to end the show with a call to action. Let's say you're 55 years old, in good health, and you have no protection for your finances or future. What would you do today to begin the process of protecting your livelihood and family? It's simple for me. It would be to start to understand, start to build a framework. And the, the first step of that is determining what your projected social security benefits going to look like. Identify if you haven't done it already when you're 55, you got to know your number. You got to know what it's going to take to get to retirement across that finish line, figure that out and just use the 4% rule. You don't have to get too crazy with the analysis. Identify what your retirement income looks like between social security and that 4% uh, distribution. And then understand what the cost of care is and then figure out how much of a gap there is for you and what that projection looks like. And then go call Costa or call somebody to, to make sure that you're addressing the long-term care risk. So that's it. 